Dave Smith here. Now, this video is going to be a little different to the videos that I've previously made, or at least I think it is in some ways, because I'm going to show you a series of images as I talk to you in this, uh, in this video. But before we get into those, let me tell you a little bit about the background. This is the, the topic of this video is something that's very close to my heart, uh, and that is of child poverty. Now, I grew up in poverty, um, really quite extreme poverty. Um, now, don't go feeling sorry for me. Uh, I've lived a very comfortable life. Uh, I'm quite an intelligent person, and my intelligence enabled me to, to some degree, ex escape that poverty. But let me tell you, it's debilitating, and it took decades for me to get out from underneath the aftermath of that poverty. But, I, but as I say, don't go feeling sorry for me. So it is a, a subject that's close to me, it is a subject I'd like to do much more work on but I find it difficult to, um, to find a way to do that uh, in, a, in a sensitive way. Um, but I, I think I'm going to look into it a bit more closely. Uh, so there are a couple of things that, uh, that occur to me. Um, in the, I think the mid 90s, um, UNICEF put out a paper that suggested that there were a hundred million street connected children in the world. Yeah, a hundred million. Almost immediately there were decriers of this, you know, it's a vast overestimate. We don't really know the number. Well, you know, frankly, why don't we? You know, these are children, these are society's most vulnerable. And we don't know how many of them are living in abject poverty. What a disgrace. But also, first off, what if it's what if it's right? Why aren't we doing something about that? And what if it's a hundred percent wrong? That still leaves fifty million street connected children in the world. Fifty million children living in abject poverty. What if it's a thousand percent wrong? Well, that's 10 million. That still leaves 10 million. The numbers beg a belief, quite honestly. And part of the issue here is uh, the NIMBY, you know, not in my backyard. It doesn't, happen, it doesn't happen where I can see it, therefore it doesn't matter. Well, actually that's not true. Because I also came across recently a, a news piece that said um, child poverty in Britain was on the increase. Now, you think, well, you know, that surely that's headline grabbing rhetoric. Well, it turns out no, because this was fact checked by the government's own uh, child minister. I can't remember the exact title of this person, but uh, on the government's own website. <coughs> In response, I think, to questions by Keir Starmer. So as t this tells you how recent this is. Um, they say yes, it is on the increase. Thirty percent—that's four million children in Britain are living in poverty. Thirty percent, nearly a third. And these statistics leave me cold. How can we possibly be living in a world where? The likes of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are apparently worth the best part of a trillion dollars in a single person and we can't lift these kids out of poverty. A third, almost a third of British children live in poverty despite decades and successive governments pledging to raise these kids out of poverty and it's getting worse. Well, shame on us. It's disgusting. But there's more even than this because uh, these charities, so UNICEF say nearly 100 million street connected children, these charities start to decry uh, how wildly inaccurate this number is. We don't really know. Then, in their next breath, they say, we must do some research. So, their response to the idea that there are 
tens of millions of children living in abject poverty on the streets of the world and all that that means is we must do some research we must take this these charitable donations that we receive from well-meaning citizens around the world and give them not to relieve the poverty of these kids on the street but to university researchers we line the pockets of the people who are already plenty rich enough universities are amongst them the richest institutions in the world let them fund the research let governments fund the research let the charitable donations lift those kids out of poverty it's disgusting it makes my blood boil anyway um, I lived in Belgium for I think around six years and I lived close to the Cintier Dixel and it was a pleasant uh, afternoon walk to sort of wander down to the cemetery, to the cemetery and have a walk through <coughs> excuse me uh, and just while away half an hour or an hour or so uh, on a sunny afternoon and I'm just going to change this image over here uh, this is an image from that uh, project now after I've been through the cemetery a few times uh, you know over, over some months it started to occur to me that hang on a minute there's at least one story here it's a very interesting place the Cynthia Dixel very um, famous and rich people are buried there and one of the things that I started to notice was um, a clear dif distinction about the wealth of the people who were uh, interred in these monuments or under them. There are plenty of fairly ordinary graves, just sort of a uh, little bit of a tombstone, long flat stone carved out, um, sort of quite stand what, what you might think of as quite standard uh, graves. <coughs> but as you look, you start to see uh, graves that are uh, bigger. They are. They have. Uh, statuary carved uh, onto the uh, gravestone and it starts to speak of the uh, affluence of the people who are buried right there uh, and as you look a little bit further and uh, uh, what I'm going to do while I'm talking to you now is to bring these images up uh, so that you can see them uh, and, and the, the, these, these monuments of the affluence start to get more grand they start to get bigger, um, more carving, more statuary, more ornate. Uh, the plots on which they stand start to get a little bigger. And that's one of the biggest indicators of wealth when you think about graveyards in um, big cities. Any city space is at, is at a premium in graveyards. So. <clears throat> When you see some of these plots getting larger and larger, you're thinking, yeah, these people are getting richer and richer. Um, and then you start to move from just the merely affluent to the actually rich. Uh, and you see these grand scale, these like like little houses almost, like Wendy houses. And there's, there's one that you'll see in this series that's um, it's like a Grecian temple. <laughs> I kid you not. Um, and, it, and it's very interesting. But if that's all the word to it, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't bat an eyelid. But there, there are very um, famous people. Victor Horta <coughs> is buried in this graveyard. And Victor Horta has designed some of the monuments for people in this graveyard. And, uh, he, and you know, Victor Horta is a famous uh, architect designing the monuments for the for the wealthy and that's an indication of how rich these people must have been because I'm pretty sure that uh, no architect is going to be designing the monument under which my body ends up lying uh, so <clears throat> so then you, you sort of move on from those clearly very wealthy people to what, I, what you might think of as well actually these are super rich uh, and the Solvay family have a plot there. Now, when you get in, when you get beyond the sort of um, 
the rich, you've gone from the affluent to the rich, and you get to the very wealthy, um, you, get, you see a seed change. They're, they're, now their monuments are much less showy, much less ornamental, much more sophisticated, but much larger plots. Uh, the Solvay family have a plot there, for example, and we'll see that. Now, the Solvay family are a very famous family in Belgium, very rich. And, uh, you know, they, they have university departments named after them. They have the Solvay Conference was instituted by the Solvay family. You know, if you've not come across the Solvay Conference, then uh, do look it up. Because in the early 20th century, the Solvay Conference, uh, and I believe it still happens, but I'm not certain. But in the early 20th century, the Solvay Conference included luminaries like uh, Erwin Schrödinger, uh, Wolfgang Pauli, uh, Enrico Fermi, Albert Einstein, Marie Curie, Pierre Curie. It brought together the, the very, very uh, brightest scientists uh, in the world in this conference. Uh, so that's an indication of how wealthy that family is. Now, as well as all of that, there are two subplots in this story. And I consider that my little series from the um, Cimetière d'Ixel is my most realised photo essay. It's got, uh, it's got a plot, there are subplots, there's, a, there's an argument, there's a denouement, a, a sort of concluding statement. Uh, and one of these subplots is just completely bizarre. When, you, when you're walking through, in the distance you'll see the back of a white, a bright white statue, a seated statue on what looks like a polished black granite uh, tomb. Uh, and as you get closer, you realise this is actually uh, a youth, it's, um, a male youth, uh, probably sort of early 20s, um, sculpted, beautifully sculpted, uh, but completely nude. And <laughs> I looked at that and I thought, whoa, what is that about? And my first thought was, well, that must have been a young man who died tragically. And his, parent, and his parents have thought this would be uh, the, the right monument. It, 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 that didn't feel comfortable to me because why, why would you have a nude sta statue of your tragically dead child? It made no sense. Well, and you'll see, you'll see the images of this. Now, this is actually quite, quite interesting because the, the grave is actually of uh, an actress called Francine Vendel, uh, I, th I think a French actress. Now Francine Vendel was uh, murdered uh, in Kinshasa. Uh, uh, she was in her mid-sixties I think and uh, she'd gone to Kinshasa to visit her sons and she was murdered by muggers in Kinshasa. But you couldn't make this stuff up quite honestly. and. This nude male statue, I mean, easily life-size, um, sits atop this grave, and I cannot, for the life of me, understand why the family thought that that would be a fit, a fitting monument to this lady. But more than that, it was uh, it was sculpted, and it is beautifully sculpted by uh, a famous French sculptor called Roger Roger Veen, I believe. Um, now, you know, why? What, what is that all about? And you come across that in the midst of all this sort of splendour and wealth and ornamentation and monuments. Uh, and I just thought that was quite an interesting little subplot for the, over, for the overarching story here about wealth. Uh, but bear with me because we're getting to um, the idea of child poverty here as well, can you believe? So that's one of the sort of little subplots, but there's another. There are World War I war graves in the Cimetière d'Ixel. And uh, they, they are just that. They're, they're rows and rows and rows of young men who died in uh, the so-called Great War, really, in World War I. Uh, 
and they're guarded by two sentinels and you see in the background of these images there are uh, sort of 1960s high-rises beyond um, but these graves are, are there and that was another interesting subplot when you think about what what war is about and particularly that first world war uh, and, and using these uh, sort of young men really uh, really in, a, in an appalling way um, just a, a, a staggering waste of life but by and large the life that's wasted is not the wealthy it's not the sons and daughters of the people buried around these soldiers these were these were young men who came uh, from poverty themselves most likely um, and so that struck me as an interesting uh, juxtaposition but let's move on let's look at uh, now we've talked about uh, these um, graves of the affluent the graves of the uh, rich the graves of the very rich solve a family and so on um, but it gets, it gets more than that because in the image that I hope is coming up now this is, uh, this is a, a massive plot of land in the midst of this in the midst of this um, inner city uh, cemetery uh, probably enough space in this to well I would say to, to bury hundreds of people uh, and there seem to be three people buried here and it's the burial site of an Iranian princess, apparently. Um, and my word, doesn't that speak of uh, of gross um, wealth? Uh, and then finally, as I'm sort of wandering around, and in fact, there's another little story in this um, cemetery that I that I didn't include. In the, and, and I may well one day go back and do a deeper project on this cemetery because it is fascinating but as I'm walking around and I went around the, the back of the uh, sort of um, office building little office block they've got there and, you go, and there's a line of um, sheds for sort of uh, upkeep of the cemetery uh, and then over there is what looks like a, uh, uh, an area of scrubland. It could could easily be a, an, an area of land that's set aside for future graves. It, it just looked like wasteland, if I'm being honest. And you'll see it coming up. Um, and at first, I I couldn't make sense of it. I, you know, I'm looking at it from this distance. I could not make sense of it. And there's this just this line of. Um, simple wooden crosses uh, and I, I, I didn't understand what it was until I got close and I saw this um, I saw this uh, child's toy and on this simple wooden cross burned into it is just a, a name and it, and it struck me these are children's graves and they're so simple uh, you know no real monuments there at all um, and I can only imagine no real intention um, and that spoke to me of child poverty these graves being so simple and and in amongst this um, this grotesque display of wealth and I I felt that that was um, that was a fitting uh, a fitting description of the world that we live in today of a hundred million children living in poverty on the streets when there are people billionaires many billionaires uh, in the world and those two things don't marry very well for me. So, just one last comment. I just wanted to mention that this whole series was shot on film uh, at the time. And uh, it really speaks strongly to me. And this whole question of child poverty, um, it really matters. Uh, 
we should not be living in the 21st century in a world where people people are hoarding uh, resources for themselves at the expense of society's most vulnerable. It makes no sense. I hope that's been of some interest. I hope you've enjoyed the images. I hope that you agree with me that it's um, that it's an example of a photo essay, a, a well-realized photo essay, uh, with an argument to present, uh, you know, and a, a, a thesis and an antithesis and a synthesis of uh, of the ideas. I would really like to hear what you think. Um, you know, what, what's your experiences? Uh, how would you tackle child poverty? Should we, should we not be taking a much stronger stance on these things? Um, there's no easy answer to child poverty because it's going to rely upon them not being billionaires. Not, not, just, not just taking their money, but they're not being billionaires at all. Nobody needs billions. Nobody. Get those kids living on the street need it. And I am just going to make one final closing statement about the Bill, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. On the face of it, that seems like uh, a very philanthropic um, stance, but I am very suspicious. And one of the things that uh, I came across recently about Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was a, a newsletter. I think they put out an annual newsletter, and in this particular newsletter, they were very self-congratulatory, very smug about the fact that the war on poverty is being won because there are few, there are now fewer people uh, living on a uh, dollar twenty-five a day. A dollar twenty-five a day has for a long time been. Um, a landmark of poverty, uh, you know, and uh, the numbers of people living on less than a dollar twenty-five a day. A dollar twenty-five a day is not. It is not the yardstick by which poverty can be measured. If you are somebody living on two dollars a day, you're not out of poverty. That's not somebody who's not living in poverty. And there's a there's a plethora of research to suggest that if you want to lift people out of poverty the yardstick should be seven dollars and forty cents a day and by that yardstick there are many many more people living in poverty now than there were and that number is rising and continuing to rise so the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation I think we have to question what their uh, priorities are. You know, they're not just giving this money; they're giving this money with strings. How do we how do we deal with this? As a world, we can't not deal with a hundred million children living in poverty, with the numbers of people, children or otherwise, living in poverty increasing year on year. And if you doubt that it's increasing year on year, just consider that the, the, the figures uh, around at the moment are suggesting that um, the, 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 the world's billionaires increased their wealth by something, something near $4 trillion during the pandemic. Well, they haven't magic that out of nowhere. We live in a world of finite resources. If they've got more, They've only got more because a whole bunch of people got less. I'm going to leave it there. I feel like I've rambled. I hope you've enjoyed the images. I'd love to hear your thoughts on these subjects, topics. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.